Good morning, church. So good to be together again. Would you like to stand to your feet? It's the first week of Advent, um, and I saw an excellent quote. It said, um, It is not that we are faithful in our waiting, but He is faithful in His coming. And so in this season, well, actually today we're celebrating our church 30th year anniversary. And, And I think more than anything, we're actually celebrating the faithfulness of God. Amen. And this morning, as we begin our worship, I want to read from Isaiah chapter 1. It was a tumultuous time in the nation of Israel, and I think for us as well. Um, God actually refers to uh, His people being drowning in sin as if they had blood-stained hands. And, and He says, wash yourselves first. But then He promises here, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And God was faithful to His promise to His people. And that's why He sent Jesus. Hallelujah. So this morning as we worship, Father, we look to You. We surrender to You. And we sing with confidence and boldness that yes, Jesus, You have defeated the power of sin over our lives. You have defeated the grave and you are resurrected and you are coming again. And so we look to you, God. Be glorified, be exalted in our praise, be exalted in our hearts, be exalted among us. We thank you, Father. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night And through the darkness 
Yes, Lord. You are the greatest of all. You are awesome, God. Lord, we thank you. We give thanks to you with all our heart. We tell of your wonder de- wonderful deeds. And we will be glad and rejoice in you always. And we will sing the praises of your name of the all most high. Lord, we thank you for the last 30 years, how you build us, you lead us to where we are right now. But God, we know that we need more of you for the next 30 years or more, the more till the day you come. Lord, we will stand firm and hold on to your truth and your words forevermore. And we'll give thanks to you always. And Lord, that we know that your grace and your favour will always be upon us. You will help us. Your word will build us up. In Christ, we'll be family filled with love, joy and peace. Lord, we cannot count the numbers of blessings that you have given to us. But God, we'll praise you always. We'll worship you no matter what. And we thank you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. everyone. I was just so touched and thinking back for the last 30 years. So I've been here since I was year five. So that's why I'm a bit touched about what we've been through and all these kind of things. So it's good to see you all and we welcome you. If it's the first time you've seen me, um, I'm, I'm not sad or anything. I'm just <laughs> filled, with, <laughs> filled with happy tears. <laughs> And I'm a mom now, so I'm, I'm allowed to cry anytime I want. I get touched very easily. <laughs> okay, so I know we're doing social distancing. I can still say hi to the person next to you. I'll wave across to the room next <laughs> just to say hi. Okay. So thank you all for keeping us to the COVID safe. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, you may be seated. <laughs> It's been seven months and a bit more since I did the last service, so we're nervous right now. Anyway, um, so today is our church 30th anniversary celebration, and yeah, so I'm really happy and how God's going to lead us through to the next 30 years and more. And um, today, our guest speaker will be Dr. John Frederick. He's a lecturer of New Testament and Greek at the Trinity College and it's great to have you here, and thank you. Um, for this Friday, Arise Youth um, will be going to ice skating. So if you're interested, even if you're older, you still want to go, um, you can go register and see Chris or any of the leaders. And um, on the 20th of December, we're having baptism. So if you're, something's touching your heart and you want to speak to someone about it or you know anyone who would be interested, um, let Samuel or Jane or any of the youth leaders know or myself or anyone that you know, you can talk to us and then we'll get you um, in contact and yeah. And um, next week, it's been ages since we have this, we're having combined service. So it will be 10 a.m. starts. It will be English and Taiwanese service combined. Um, there will be English translation, I believe, or somehow it's going to make it work so we can all be able to understand each other. <laughs> okay. So as we continue to our worship and our time of giving um, due to COVID, we now encourage um, an online transfer. There's a bank details up there. You can do your transfer now if you feel like, or you can do it later. Um, if you have your tithes and offerings here with you today, there's bags at, out at the back and the front where you can put your giving in. And um, yes, so today's Bible reading is from Psalm 42. 
Verse 1. As a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, Where is your God? These, thing, these things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one, with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throne. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon from Mount Mizar, deep coals to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. This is the word of the Lord. So that's welcome, Dr. John Frederick. Good morning. morning. It's really a a pleasure and a joy to be with you and to find that it's the 30th anniversary today and to celebrate that with you by breaking into the Word of God and breaking open the Word of God and to hear it afresh today. This is a famous psalm and it's, it's been kind of the genesis of a lot of hymns through the ages. You might have heard that beginning part in some of the older hymns about the deer panting. And uh, so if you have your Bible and you want to open up to Psalm 42, we're going to go through the psalm today and really press into the main themes of the psalm. But first what I want to do is just pray that God's Spirit that inspired this book, every word in here, the living act of the Holy Spirit of God, work through the pages of Scripture, the words of Scripture in our hearts this morning. That is my expectation. When we open the Word of God, we hear from the living God, who is water to our souls. He's water to our souls, and we need that water. Without that water, we have nothing. We have no ability to self-generate that water. We have no ability to create that within ourselves. We need something from outside to come in to bring our souls refreshment. You know what I'm saying? Let's pray to God. Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you not only inspired the words of this book, but you brought your people through water out of Egypt into the promised land. And you bring us through water and baptism and faith out of sin and death into the promise of resurrection life. We place our trust in you this morning and we ask, God, that your Holy Spirit that inspired these words would be working in our hearts so that we leave this place with a hunger and thirst for you that cannot be quenched by anything except for you, God. That this would be anything but conventional, but that this would be a miracle that you do in our heart this morning as you do every day and you've done from the beginning of time. We pray these things in Jesus' great name. Amen. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Why is that such an evocative little passage of Scripture? It's because we're all human. And when we talk about thirst, and in this case it's a deer, but if you don't resonate with deer, we all need water too, especially on days like this and days like yesterday. When we think about the need that we feel for water, It's something that goes deep within the human body and the human soul. When we say, I need water, it's not, I would like some water, but if I don't get it, that would be okay too. When you're really thirsting, when you're panting, when you came back from a run, when you've been outside in the heat all day, you're not saying, I would like some water, but if there's none, that's okay. You're saying, I need water. I'm going to die without water. And it's not an overreaction. First, 
you thirst, and if you don't quench that thirst, then you die. The human body requires water, requires something from outside of itself to sustain itself, to bring it refreshment, to make it whole, to make it healed. We cannot exist without water. I was at the Gold Coast yesterday at Dream World. It was really hot yesterday, and I was very proud of myself because I brought five big bottles of water. We got two kids and my wife, and we thought this will last us all day. It lasted us an hour tops. So then, what I didn't want to do, I had to do, which was spend like $30 on bottled water. Now I'll get 10 cents each when I return those to the uh, thing, so I'll make some of that back. But it's the fact that I felt yesterday, and it was ironic because I knew I'd be preaching on this, that that deep sense of thirst is, is just insatiable. We need the water. We need the water. Do you feel that way about God? The same thirst that you have when you feel like you're in a dry and weary land, when you need refreshment, do you feel that way about God? Is that your default? Is that the mode that you operate from? If it is, then this word will be a reminder this morning. If it's not, which to me it's not always the case, this word will be a convicting word that helps you recalibrate your soul to thirst for God. And what we're going to find is when we thirst for God, two things happen according to this psalm. When we thirst for God, the soul that is operating according to the logic of the living water of God remembers our brokenness and spiritual thirst causes us to return to the source of living water. We remember our brokenness and we return to God. Our hope, our life, our living water. And so let's look at the first one, remembering our brokenness. And this is what the psalm does. Now, the original context of this psalm was a person who lived in Jerusalem who was at quite a distance from the God that he loved in the temple, the presence of God in the temple, and the people that he worshipped with and the family that he belonged to. How do we know this? Well, if you look at verse 6, it says, My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, and of Mount Mitzar. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I don't know the geography incredibly well of, you know, the Holy Land. But this, we do know, is very far from Jerusalem and from Judah. It's outside the bounds of anywhere near the temple and near the people of God. So this means this person was separated from probably family, friends, worshiping community, and separated from the presence of God which was concentrated in the temple. And he's crying out, and we know from Psalm 43, which in the original was actually part of Psalm 42, it was, it was actually just one big psalm, that the psalmist desires to return to the holy hill of God, to the dwelling place of God. He desires to go back and be with God. And what we find is that when the psalmist experiences this, he experiences it as a thirst, a thirst that reminds him of his brokenness. And we know this because as we look at the psalm, he keeps talking about how broken he is. Sometimes we don't feel comfortable talking about brokenness. But the fact of the matter is that we all know that brokenness dwells not just out there, but deep within our hearts. The desire to escape from brokenness by looking within or replacing and pasting over that brokenness from things that come outside from the world never fulfills its promise to heal. It always leaves us thirsting. We try to quench that thirst with something other than God, and it leaves us in a very dry place without any water. Have you felt that before? There's not a lot of space sometimes in Christianity to be able to feel like you can have a psalm like this. It's good to smile, and actually today is a day to smile. But a lot of times... If we're honest, when we come into this building, when we come into small group, when we think about God, we're not smiling. We're in a place of struggle. And we say, I wish Christianity could accommodate the struggle. And the psalmist says, let me show you how it works. My tears have been my food, he says in verse 3, day and night. And I say to myself, tears are his food? You see what the, the author is doing? He's playing with water. He's saying, I'm drinking my tears. That's how depressed I am. And then he says in verse 5, Why are you cast down, O my soul? 
Why are you in turmoil within me? And he says that again in verse 11. He often talks about how he feels that God has forgotten him. And in the Christian church, sometimes we default to happy smiles and a shiny, happy faith, but there's no place for the soul that's lamenting because you're broken and you need to be fixed. We're broken and we need to be fixed. We're incomplete and we need to be made whole. Do you feel complete right now? If you're on the journey, you might feel like you're being made complete, but if we're honest, human life at any point is a struggle with the reality for a Christian that God exists and God's making all things new, but I feel broken. I feel incomplete. And that's what the psalmist is saying. And in this season, I think it's incredibly pertinent for us. We have just come out of a season, and this is, I understand, like the fifth or sixth time you all have been able to meet again in this capacity. You've been on Zoom, which is lovely, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, if you've been doing any Zoom meetings where you can see people from a distance, but it's not the same as sitting next to people or sitting around a table with people, right? And that's a small thing to complain about, but it's not just that. For me, and I don't know about for any of you, I have family that do not live in this area, indeed do not live in this country. I can't see my family. I can't go to visit my family. They're far from me. If I leave Australia, they're not going to let me back in, right? And it's like, that's not good until I get permanent residency. So pray for me on that. Because I want to live here. But it's, it's a sad thing. It's a struggle. The people we want to be closest to, the people we worship with, the people who we love dearly and deeply, we're often separated from in this season. And not only that, but if we're honest, and this is hard for Christians to talk about, words like depression and stress and anxiety do not go away when you pronounce Jesus as Lord and Savior. We struggle with that. We feel like they should. Maybe my faith is not strong enough. Maybe I have to give more time to the word. And yet they're still there. And we struggle with these things as broken human beings. And even, even when we become Christians, they're still there. And we're trying to make it. How do we balance these things like the psalmist has balanced? And what the psalmist does not do is paste over them. What the psalmist does not do is come up with a suitable, more expedient solution that comes to him from his own heart when he looks within. What the psalmist does is say, I thirst. I thirst for God. I am broken and I need to be made whole. He remembers his brokenness. He doesn't turn into himself. He doesn't turn outward to the ideologies of the world. He remembers his brokenness and then he redirects his gaze to God who alone can make him whole. He thirsts. He remembers. And he returns to the source. Our God, our life, is a lizard on the wall. <laughs> you just got my... I'm preaching the gospel and the lizard's just going... Dee -dee. <laughs> Things like that make life bearable when it's difficult. But the psalmist really is in this dark place. He's not pasting it over, right? He's dealing with it and he's saying, this thirst makes me remember that without God, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. But that's not all. He not only remembers because of his thirst, he is redirected and returning to the source of living water, which is to say God. And there's actually a pattern and a paradox about this. So in the second point, I want to talk about the pattern first. And you can see the pattern just on the surface level of the read of the word here. What I want to do is then have us apply that pattern to ourselves. Right? So that we can acknowledge our brokenness, but then turn to the one who can make us whole. God will make you whole. If you feel like you're totally complete right now, that's a wonderful, strange anomaly. The human heart is so broken. You can feel that brokenness. You're allowed to feel that brokenness as a Christian. But God will lift up your head. You cannot do it on your own, but God will do it. You will still struggle, but he will persevere you to the end. God will do it. And this is what it says. He says, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God in verse 2. And then what is his response? When shall I come and appear before God? See, he identifies the problem and his thirst for God generates a solution. What is that solution? It's worship. It's, it's the love of God. It's the seeking of God. He identifies the problem, his brokenness, and he looks for a solution, God. But that's not the only time he says this. He says it more in verse 4. 
These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go to the throng and lead them in procession in the house of God. With glad shouts and songs of praise, keeping a multitude with the festival. He's describing how he was a worship leader in the temple. How he'd lead other people into the presence of God. And isn't it the case that as Christians, we sometimes act like we're individual persons in a relationship with God, when really he calls us as individual persons to be an integrated community of people. When I come in, I have to say, when I come in the presence, it's not just because your band is really good, um, but they are. Um, so I love that. But when I come into this place, I feel the presence of God. Do you know what I'm saying? Have you experienced that? It's, and it's not, even, it's not the design of the building or anything necessarily. It's that the people of God are gathering here together. It's not just that there's power in numbers. It's realizing that I am called out of the loneliness, insufficiency, insignificance, and inability of my own self into a people that together will become strong in the Lord. When I am realizing my brokenness and my thirst for God, and when the psalmist realizes his brokenness and his thirst for God, that makes him flee to the fount, the only fount that can give living water and life, Jesus Christ. But we forget this so often even though we sing about it. We forget it even though we read about it and study it. It becomes conventional rather than life-changing. But this is truth of the gospel. My soul, this is most, in verse 6, this is with a pattern of returning to God becomes really profound. Verse 6, my soul is cast down within me. He's coming out again. This is like his third emotional outcry. But look what he says next. What's that word? Therefore, I remember you. Isn't that a peculiar thing? My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you. Therefore, you see, the default position of the one who operates according to the logic of the one who seeks living water is to say, when I am broken, the only natural thing to do is go to the fount that gives living water. When I am thirsty, I cannot quench my own thirst. When I'm broken, I cannot heal my own brokenness. When I am down and out and cast down and in turmoil, there's nothing I can do but turn to God who sustains me in the midst of that struggle. That's who God is. That's who God always has been. But that's peculiar to us as contemporary worshipers. We thirst. We remember. We return to the source, the living water, the one who gives hope. But here's the paradox. I said there was a pattern and a paradox. It's not just that when we thirst, we remember brokenness and we return to the source of God. It's not just that. That's the pattern, but here's the paradox. In every other instance of drinking of a liquid, whether it be Gatorade, which is my son's favorite drink. I prefer Powerade. Um, I think it's far better, but um, I'm, I'm getting controversial now. Uh, but let's say water, a dream world, when you're taking a big bike ride or a run. When you drink that water, you want to alleviate the thirst. You want the thirst to go away. You want to complete the thirst and move on to being not thirsty. But how could a Christian ever be filled or have their fill of the infinite love of the living water of God? See, the, the paradox of the gospel and the paradox of this passage is that it's the one who eternally and unendingly thirsts who is ultimately quenched. The thirst that we have for God is not something we're meant to deal with and get on with. And sometimes we think of that as Christians. We had a mountaintop experience and then there's the rest of our Christian lives. No, it's we have a mountaintop experience and we have every day coming to the fountain of living water. We are so needy and we will never not be needy. But God is so good and so giving and so gracious. That's what makes our relationship with him different than any other religion. And any other ideology, you cannot self-generate it. You cannot read it from a self-help book that you get in your local store. You can only get it from the streams of living water that come from Jesus. Yes, our thirst should be something that's ongoing and continual. That sounds bad, but it's actually good. Because if we stop being thirsty, we're full. And if we're full, we fall asleep. And if we're asleep, 
we miss the call of God to grow toward him and to grow in justice and peace toward the world. What does it say in Matthew 5, verse 6, when you get to the Beatitudes? Matthew 5, verse 6, talks about being hungry and being thirsty. It says, blessed is the one who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. And the thing about this is it shows the principle of Psalm 42. Hunger and thirst in Matthew 5, verse 6 in Greek are in the present tense. Who cares? Well, here's why it's important. Greek in the present tense, you cannot find this in, in the English translation or in any translation in any language, indicates a continual aspect. That is to say, encoded in the Greek there is this idea, not just that you should hunger once and thirst once and then you do something else like play like Nintendo Switch or something. Which I've been doing a lot of these days. Nothing wrong with Nintendo Switch, but the idea is you hunger and you continually hunger and you continually thirst and only the one who continually hungers and thirsts will be satisfied. Because if you're full on God, you're asleep on God and if you fall asleep on God, you start to believe the myth of self-sufficiency. That when things get rough, that when pandemic breaks in, that when depression rises up, you can deal with that on your own. But the truth of the matter is, we are so broken that we need God. And when we thirst for God, this is the right disposition of someone who's operating according to that logic. So what I want to tell you, my friends, this morning is that you have permission not to have a shiny, happy faith. You have permission in God to have an emotionally honest faith. A faith that is emotionally honest and that anchors itself in God. Unless you are anchored in Him, you will drift and you'll drown. But if you are anchored in Him, you will persevere. Not because you are so great, but because He is so strong. Jesus gives us to drink not only of H2O. He gives us to drink of the fount of living water today, tomorrow, and for all eternity, world without end. There's no way you can top that. Every other fount is a broken tap. It produces water that evaporates once it hits the enormous heat that we deal with of everyday life. But the living water of God cannot be evaporated by sin and death. And hear me when I say that sin and death encroach upon the joy of what it means to be human. In a world that is healed, there will not be global pandemic. In a world that is healed in the book of Revelation at the end, there'll be no crying and no pain. There'll be no more overwhelming anxiety and no more depression, but we deal with that now. The tap that the world offers is broken and it evaporates, but the living water stays far beyond the living water does not evaporate because of sin. The living water continues through sin. And it defeats sin. And it defeats death. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing can separate you from a need and a thirst for the living water that God provides. A water that will be unendingly asking you to thirst for it but everlastingly giving you quenching of the soul. That's the promise of God. That's the promise of the psalmist. That indeed when you thirst, you remember your brokenness, but you don't stay there. You return to the source. God, our hope, our life, our living water. So what I want to leave you with today is this. We thirst, and we remember, and then we return to God. If that's how you approach the life of faith, you will never be thirsty in the, in the deepest sense, and you will always be full. Let's pray. Lord God, we are totally unable in and of ourselves to quench the problems and the thirst that we have from sin and death and our own insufficiency. We cannot bridge the chasm that separates us from you. But you, Lord, met us at the well and gave us living water. You said, whoever believes in me out of their heart, living water will well up to eternity.
eternal life. The water that you give does not evaporate, Lord, but conquer sin and Satan and death. And even as we thirst today, make, make this day a day where we feel the heat of the sun. And when we thirst, let us think that you will be the one who ultimately gives us satisfaction. We pray this in Jesus' great name. Amen. Why don't you stand to your feet again?
remember and return to me. So as the worship team continues um, to play, let's just spend this moment, if you're comfortable, you can pray out loud. Use this time to repent and return to God. Be blessed.